I found myself reading about bootstrapping more and more. Now, I know what you're thinking. A VC reading about bootstrapping? Yeah, guilty. In fact, my knowledge has led me to the man who literally wrote the book on bootstrapping, and he's about to serve up the 10 immutable laws of bootstrapping so that you too can enjoy your pursuit of making billions. Let's get into it. Hey, welcome to another episode of Making Billions. I'm your host, Ryan Miller, and today I have my dear friend, James Benham. James is the tech entrepreneur in the insure tech space. As a co-founder and CEO of JB Knowledge, he has built an impressive tech company that supports a massive need for carriers today. Not only that, but he has written the manual on bootstrapping your business called Be Your Own VC, 10 Bootstrapping Principles to Generate Cash and Keep Control. So what this means is James understands how to build a company from the ground up and is about to teach you and I the key principles on how to do the same. So James, welcome to the show, man. Thanks, Ryan. Glad to be here. Love the show. Uh, it sounds like you built a really great community here and uh, enjoy listening to it and glad to be on. Yeah, thank you. It's it's an honor. We've we've hit the top 2% in the world and it's all because of amazing guests just like you. So we're fortunate to have you and I'm excited to get into that. And we're going to get into all the stuff about bootstrapping, but right out of the gates, maybe you can warm us up. Who Who's James? What do you do now? And then we can get into some, some tasty tips for the beginners. Sure. I'm from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, uh, the deep South. Did a couple of internships with PricewaterhouseCoopers. Decided that wasn't for me. Called my dad up, called a high school buddy of mine up and said, let's start a company and deliver high quality enterprise software services to the small to medium market. And that was 23 years ago. Uh, I've really enjoyed building a, a global business. We've got offices in Argentina and South Africa and Texas. And uh, we've got people in some other countries other than that, which is really exciting. 280 teammates now. And we service some of the largest insurance companies in the world. So the original plan was to service small to medium companies. And now, we, now we've now we got some monsters as far as the, the size of company that we work for. And we build uh, great software every day. We did bootstrap with a few thousand bucks in the, in the dorm room to here. Uh, I've got an amazing co-founders, amazing teammate. It's, it's been a, it's been a, been a, been a fun ride for the last, uh, the last 44 years. Man, I'll, I love it, my man. So you're, you're a busy guy. So the riches are in the niches and yes, I, in a former life, I'm still a recovering executive, but I was a CFO of an insurance company. So I do have a lot of love for that industry and folks, it's a very exciting industry. I didn't think so until you get into it. And all of a sudden you're like, Oh, this, the insurance industry is humongous. It is fantastic. And we're going to chop it up. And this is why I was excited to have you in because anybody in high finance or anything in finance really knows their stuff. And my friends, James is definitely one of these guys. So, you know, let's, let's talk to the beginners in the audience. What would you say in your experience? Cause you talk a lot about be your own VC bootstrap, these 10 principles. What are those 10 principles and how do they help people win in the early days? Yeah. Well, there's a lot of discussion in the business community about putting your pitch deck together and going and raising money and pitching VCs and getting angel investors and friends and family around and angel round and pre-seed round and series A, series B, series C. And that's a, you know, that's a crazy train that you can hop on. And, and look, it does work sometimes. It does work sometimes. Uh, but it, you know, I, I really posit that there, there's a different way of building a business that really wasn't talked about well in college, uh, you know, degree in accounting, master's in business. We just didn't talk about bootstrapping. You know, they talk a lot about leverage and debt and fundraising, but they don't talk about building what you have to build so you can build what you want to build and maintaining control and building a business for a lifetime. And you know, they, there's a lot of really great things about bootstrapping. There's a lot of horrifying things about bootstrapping as well. But when I got through with selling smart bid, which was one of our subsidiaries, I said, you know, I get asked for business advice a lot. I mentor students at Texas A&M still, cause I'm only a few miles from campus. I really enjoy talking about it, but I, I needed to write all this down and put it in a book and just say, Hey, look, read this and then call me. And then we'll talk after you've read this. Cause this encapsulate most of my advice and most of the advice that my father, who's you know, a really close friend of mine uh, has given me. And, uh, you know, obviously business partner too, co-founder and same thing with Sebastian Costa, my chief operating officer, right-hand man, great friend and business partner, you know, all the advice that they gave me and the stuff I learned along the way. And I just tried to boil it down to 10 really important points that I think are important to remember for people. And then backed it up with a lot of stories. And so we definitely talk about cash being king because I've seen so many companies go out of business. You know, they, they grow their way out of business because they, they're ignoring the cash flow and, and, and ignoring cash reserves. When COVID hit, we saw a lot of companies get caught short on cash because they weren't thinking about having cash reserves and really paying attention to that cash flow statement, paying attention to generating cash and collecting cash and, and stockpiling it, how important it is. We talk about, you know, you know, rule number two, getting out of and staying out of debt. I mean, that's super important. I'm a huge Dave Ramsey fan 
And I'm, I'm a really big opponent of leverage unless you absolutely need it for equipment or facilities. I have a really big problem with heavily levering up. And you know, also talk about a lot about my kind of like my main central premise of bootstrapping is that you have to have an incredible amount of patience and being willing to wait and wait and wait and wait. And you have to build a cash machine first, and then you can use that cash to build what you really want to do. So I say you have to build what you have to so you can build what you want to. That's that, that next rule. Because that you, you it, that's what we had to do. We had to build a cash-generating machine in our service business so that we could take that cash and fund our product business, which is the business we really wanted to invest in. Then you also talk about the number one rule of business, which is survive. You know, A lot of people kind of forget that the main thing you're supposed to do as a CEO is manage risk, mitigate risk, and help the business survive difficult times like COVID, like economic collapses, like 9-11, which happened right after I started this business, like the dot-com bust, which happened right before I started this business, like the, the Great Recession in 2008, which you know decimated so many companies. You've got to learn how to survive. Fifth rule is to choose your partners as carefully as you choose your spouse. I mean, you got to be really careful with your partners, and you got you got to pick them really carefully and really cautiously. I see a lot of people hand out equity way too fast to people that don't end up being in the business later. And so you got to be really cautious with that. And so we talk about those. And then, you know, the next one is get out and sell. I talk about the CEO being the chief evangelizing officer. I see, I meet a lot of CEOs, especially uh, bootstrap CEOs that think they can just hire a salesperson to go do the pitching for them. And the reality is in a bootstrap business, you, you, the, the top dog's got to go sell. You've got to go close deals and you got to be willing to get out and sell and do it yourself. I still do demos every week. I still call on prospects every week. I still travel and call on prospects every week. Uh, <laughs> I've got 280 people and I am still heavily involved in account management and sales. And then we talk about being willing to rewrite your rules, but not your values. And a whole, have a whole set of stories around when we went to Argentina, maintaining our values, but changing our business rules so our business would work in Argentina, the same as South Africa. You know, you have to be w- willing to say, hey, look, we have, our, we have our six core values for us. I'll talk about those later. We've got our six core values. We're not going to compromise our core values, but we are going to modify some of our rules so we can work better in certain markets. Um, you know, the last three, uh, you know, of, of, the, of the, my 10 on this book were to make innovation a habit and a process that you actually have to really put money and resources and people into innovation. It's, it just doesn't happen in the spare time. Rule number nine is that you always get paid last, you know, as, as a, as a founder or co-founder an executive, whether you're the CEO, CFO, COO, you got to recognize that the staff's needs have to come first and that, that your needs come last. Uh, you know, and, and then lastly, just say we have this thing that really came out of, out of fly, flying and piloting for so many years that you have to establish and communicate your personal minimums, which is something we do in flying. We set personal minimums for what we will and won't do and what we will and won't fly in. And you have to really do that in business, too. You've got to establish these these core set of personal minimums so that you've you've got your values, you've got your ideas of what you will and won't do, and especially when it comes to selling a business, you've got to have these really clear before you step into the sales process. And so anyway, that's 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 what the, the you know, in a nutshell, the 10 big rules are for me on, on being your own VC and, and bootstrapping a business. Man, that's brilliant. So those 10 rules on bootstrapping your business, those are 10 different ways. You think about that. I asked him for one, he gives us 10. He's, he's a good guy. I appreciate that generosity. So there's 10 ways in the early days, folks, that you can win according to the gospel of James. So how do you not lose? Because it's not right. You can get points on the board. Sure. That's great. We need to do that. However, sometimes you can get spanked a little bit and sometimes bad and, and it can tank you. What are some advice? What is some advice you can give to beginners on how not to lose in the early days? Well, <laughs> the big thing on not losing is to make your mistakes small. You know, when you're when, in any business and like this applies to a VC funded business, uh, a friends and family funded business, an angel funded business or a self funded bootstrap business, you've got to make mistakes small. And where, where you really see businesses tend to tend to have to shut down after a few years is they proceed with this core premise. They come to this inevitable intersection where they realize that many of their core assumptions they began the business with were not correct, and they have to pivot the product because they're they're seeking the most important thing, and that's product market fit, right? They're seeking that fit between the product and the market so that people see your stuff, and they say the most important things. I have to have that, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the challenge is they're seeking product market fit, and they get to that pivot point, and they burn so much capital that they, they, don't, they can't afford to pivot and they go out of business, which happens all the time. That reality brings me back to that, that you know, main advice is just make mistakes small. Experiment, but don't blow all of your cash. <clears throat> build the product, but build the MVP, the minimum viable product. Don't build the Cadillac, build the Chevy. Build the things that'll get you down the road so you can get it in front of customers and you can find out if that, if you, when they said they were interested, if they actually will give you a credit card to pay money. Yeah. There's a huge difference between a prospect saying, man, if you all built that, I would totally buy it. And then you go back to them and you say, okay, give me your credit card. 
that's when that's when the rubber hits the road because a lot of them back out at that point in time because everybody will tell you what they think you want to hear. Thank you for watching. If you've made it this far, we must be friends. So don't forget to like, subscribe, and click that notification button. Now, let's get back to the show. And so it comes, just all comes back to making your mistakes small. You focus on the MVP, and then you experiment, see if there's a market for it, and then you move on, modify that until you get the first few customers. Then you obsess over your first few customers and make sure they're super happy, so they'll be a reference client for you. And then you, you work on making the system work really well for them. You respond very quickly. And then as soon as you get them calmed down and settled in regular operations, then you can really start going after the market with things that, that, you, that you've decided to do in a product. Really tough, but if you make those mistakes real big in the early days, you won't survive the pivot. Man, so developing product market fit and also just make your mistakes early, which is a cool and small. Of small. Yeah. So those are some very, very good pieces of wisdom for people to just not screw up and not lose in the early days. And and, and part of that, Ryan, is is finding a niche too. You know, like that if you can if you can really find something narrow that you can be really good at. It's a lot easier to identify your competitors to compete in a market, to find the right trade shows and the associations. If you're if you're really broad in the early days, especially with the bootstrap business, it's just too expensive to go by the market. Agreed. So yeah, so it it, it does, and I 100% agree, my man James. The the riches are in the niches. Go first, you go deep, then you go wide, not the other way around. And too often, I've seen entrepreneurs who end up not being very successful is they go wide too soon. It's better to be 100 miles deep and two inches wide than it is to be the opposite. Right. So, so that being said, I'm just curious about the market. Now I know you service a lot of the insurance market, but this is reflective of different startups. So I'd love to just go speaking about going deep, let's go deep on your product and see what lessons we can pull out of that. But where do you see as far as the insurance market or any other market you want to talk about, where is it at? And then we can talk about where you think it's going. Yeah. I mean, insurance and insure tech. So, and then you have to define what the heck insure tech is, please. Because, <laughs> you know, um, there have been software companies and insurance for decades now. Mm-hmm. One of the challenges the insurance market has is that it was an early adopter to mainframe systems. And so you have a lot of legacy AS400, COBOL, Java, old Java systems that are running the industry. And by running, I mean the policy administration systems, the claims handling systems, the data aggregation, reporting, exchange, EDI systems. They're, they're built on some really old legacy tech. And it's really hard to, to migrate. So they really have like a first movers burden, you know, where they adopted early with digital solutions because they really needed to, to manage the data and the money. The end result is now they're left with a, a pretty large uh, you know, le- legacy burden. Whereas the pre- one of the, you know, the other industries, smart bid, the the company we sold in 2018 was in the construction space. They were still largely on Microsoft Excel. I mean, 60, 70% of the industry was Excel. So that, that was a a little bit of an easier migration. Whereas insurance, um, you have to deal with these really big old tech legacy systems and what to do with them and how to get the data out. And the data is super messy. And so it's uh, that's really a, a, a huge challenge. It's a very automated industry. I mean, the, it really is very automated in some regards and very not automated in others. And there's still a lot of Excel spreadsheets that drive really crit- mission critical tasks in insurance. I mean, there's, still, there's a lot of Excel. In fact, you can you can underwrite and issue and renew policies on Excel and Word all day long without even using a core system. And some of the largest insurance carriers do that for new lines of business. So I'd say that's it. Um, insure Tech is a company that's leveraging modern tech, IoT, mobile, you know, connected APIs. People used to say blockchain, and now they've kind of given up talking about blockchain. Um, and, and of course, now they're talking a lot about AI and you know, leveraging that combination and big data to a big extent. Big data is a really hot thing in insure tech, and leveraging it to really transform the speed at which you can get a quote and you can bind the policy and you can pay and the speed at which you can resolve and settle a claim and then the accuracy with which you set rates for the for the insurance policy and the accuracy with which you recommend how much and what should be paid out on claims so that's really kind of insure tech as a whole but the the main line like you know old players, big multi-billion dollar players in the insurance carrier and TPA space have invested so heavily in technology that it's kind of hard to even distinguish companies that identify as insure tech and companies that identify as traditional carriers because they a lot of them have identical parallel efforts on IoT, on big data, on connectivity, on APIs. And so it's really it's really a fascinating time where the rubber's starting to hit the road and uh, it's reflected by the biggest uh, trade show in InsureTech. It's called InsureTech Connect in Vegas. And there's tens of thousands of people there. It's a huge, massive show. And, you know, you, you see the shakeout, you know, of the of uh, the, the exciting tech that didn't deliver a lot of value to the, to the main players. Um, and there was also a, a pretty big push 
among the insure tech community several years ago to raise a lot of money and then disintermediate brokers, cut them out of the middle mm -hmm. and sell direct to the consumer or direct to the business. And that hasn't worked out really well for a lot of them. And if you look at like one of the biggest examples that was a high flying public stock at one point, there's really two of them, Lemonade and Hippo, mm -hmm. both are 80 to 95% down from their market highs, their five year highs. Like 80 to 95% down from their, their peak market value, which is really appalling how much equity value they've lost over the last why three you, years. So, so I'm going to chime in on that. So I'm curious, why do you think that is? Because it's folks, we're not just talking about insurance, even though we are talking about insurance, we're talking about general startups. There's market forces, there's internal forces, there's a lot of things going on. There's impressions that, hey, this new thing, this new distribution, it's going to take over the market. We're all going in this direction. Everybody line up, fall in line and go this way. We had a few people do it. And it's not working out for them. Well, financially, Why do you it's not think that out. is? Financially, yeah, it's not working out for them. You're right. So I'm curious of what you think. What happened? Yeah, well, we have this thing called a loss ratio in insurance. That's the the, yeah. you know, you the basic loss ratio is like the, the amount of premium you collect versus the amount of claims you pay out. And then yeah. the difference there is what you have to run the company out of and then hopefully have a profit left. And the loss ratios on these high-flying insure techs have been absolutely terrible, like really bad. They've been bleeding a lot of cash. And so their core premise in raising so much capital and having such a high valuation, their core premise was that they were going to be able to set rates more accurately pay claims more accurately, more rapidly, uh, that they were going to be able to acquire business faster to go direct to the consumer. And the reality is they're getting eaten alive by their marketing expenses. Their loss ratios are way too high. They're paying out too much on claims. And so a lot of these assumptions have not yielded actual financial results. And, you know, profitability is like gravity. It applies whether you want it to or not. You've, you've got to generate a profit in a business or it's not worth anything. Yes. Despite the fact that it may have IPO'd for billions of dollars, you know, the, the fact is that the public markets are brutal. If you don't make money and deliver value back to the shareholders, you get shellacked on your equity value, as you should. Yes. And, you know, the growth at all costs VC funded mindset leads founders to believe that if they just keep growing top line, that they'll continue to be rewarded. And that's uh, just not how it works when you go to the public market. There it is. Yeah. So top line growth. So this is a lesson that we've learned here. Top line growth, right? It's great, right? We, I, I build financial, well, I've done the whole thing. So we te technically, we will, a lot of the times just still teach you, you build a financial model, you grow your revenue, and then everything is linked to that. But this is one of the things that we learn. And number two, so top line growth is important, but it's not everything. That's number one. You keep me honest, James. Number two, what I think I'm hearing is this This is something that I always understand. I'll, I'll give you folks a little, little trick that I do as a VC. So when I meet a founder and if they're obsessed with building a great product, well, yeah, you got to do that. But when I meet an experienced founder, meaning someone who really knows the industry, someone like James, for example, they also focus on distribution. And so what you were talking about is these guys have these direct to consumer models and all these different things happen. But where it went sideways was distribution. And so it's not enough to have top line growth. That is important. It's not enough to just have a great product. That is important. But it is also equally important. Just my opinion. James, you did not say that. This is just me from a, from the other side. The, the, the vulture capital in me tells me that you also really need to pay attention to distribution. It does you no good to build the world's best product that no one's ever heard of. So distribution matters, I would argue, just as much as a quality product and just as much as top line revenue growth. Would you agree? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Marketing is generating demand for a product and sales is converting that demand into revenue, right? That's yeah. just in general. Some people conflate sales and marketing into like one term and like these are very different dis disciplines. Distribution and distribution is a phrase we use a lot in insurance. And we really understand what it means because it's a very well-defined term. When we say distribution in the tech industry, they don't always exactly understand what you're talking about. That's yeah, just, that's fair. Yep. It, it, just in general, it's kind of a weird thing, weird anomaly. I, I, I love the insurance definition of distribution though, and that is how you distribute your product from the source originator of the paper to the people that are buying the paper mm -hmm. and you know and, and generally and this is continuing to happen you know that carriers generally distribute through brokers because it turns out despite all the arguments about brokers being well needing to be uh, disintermediated the reality is that people need a, a trusted advisor to, to shepherd them through what they need to buy and what lines they need to buy and from whom and going on websites just doesn't really do it for a whole lot of people 
And so distribution is crazy important, but distribution is important in every industry, not just insurance, super important in, in technology. Like we've got to figure out how do we get this product to market? Are we going to have resellers? Are we going to have value added resellers? Are we going to go out and have a referral program? Are we going to go direct and we're going to just have build a large sales force and sell direct? You know, what are we going to do here to get our product in people's hands and how much is it going to cost? Now, my general experience has been that you take whatever you spent building the product and you double it and that's what you'll spend distributing it, right? Like that's, or, you know, that, well, that's what you'll spend total. So whatever you spend developing will be about what you spend on selling it. And people really underestimate how much it costs to buy the ads and to hire salespeople and to hire marketing people and then craft the language and then seek all the different channels. You know, if you're in a tech company, there might be, you know, your omni-channel marketing strategy, maybe 10 channels, right? Organic search, paid search, organic social, paid social, recommendation websites that you pay per lead for. Uh, and then you get into, you know, traditional uh, trade shows, you know, cold calling, email, text message campaign, traditional print ads, online ads, display ads, video network ads. You just keep going, right? There's a lot of different ways to try and reach people. Now, the really screwed up part right now, Ryan, and it really got hosed by COVID, in my opinion, uh, it has been, has been distribution right now. Because back in the day, which was a Wednesday, uh, you, could, you could get on the phone and call people and they would answer the phone. They don't do that anymore. During COVID, we couldn't see people in person. And so everyone went hard on investing in digital distribution for their products, right? They went hard on Google ads. They went hard on email marketing. They went hard on text message marketing. They went hard on cold calling because they couldn't attend a trade show or meet people in person. So it, it just filled all those channels up. And now people get bombarded. I got, I counted before this show because I knew this question was going to come up. I counted 11 spam calls I got today. So I just ignore calls now that I don't recognize the number for because I don't have time to deal with it because it's never, it's never a client or a prospect. And then the, I, I probably get 200 spam emails a day and probably 15 spam texts in a given day. And so I, like so many other people, just ignore it now. And because, because it, whenever I answer or look at it, it's never a client or a prospect. I always recognize those numbers. And so that's, that's been a problem with distribution is that distribution also shifts and changes and ebbs and flows and depending on what's working and what's not working. And, and so, you know, right now, uh, we're going kind of old school again. You know, I'm hitting the road. I'm doing trade shows. I'm pressing the flesh, working on referral strategies. So it's a, it's a bit of a different distribution model right now for me. I'm still buying Google ads on some products, but not others now. And that was never the case in the past. Man, I love it. So focus on distribution. That's important. Product quality, top line revenue growth. Hard to pick uh, a most important one, but we'll call those the the holy trinity of, of bootstrapping. I don't know. I just made that up. That could be total crap, but we'll see. But um, Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah, sure. And so as we round third base, you have a breadth of knowledge, my man. I'm wondering if you have maybe like you've already given 10 in the beginning, but I'm wondering if we can get maybe two or three more things from you. Just speak to the entrepreneurs that are out there. And folks, if you're launching a fund, that's an entrepreneur. If you're launching a business software, just if you are literally building something and you hope that the market and will back you up and give you that top line growth, this is for you. So what are two or three things that you could speak to someone in that position and just give them that knowledge who are really looking to just maybe be like you one day? Sure. I'd say other than the 10 rules that I laid out that really sum up so much in this number one, and I'm a limited partner at a few VC funds. So I should full disclose that while I strongly encourage people to bootstrap their business, it is definitely not the only path or even it's not always the best path. Sometimes you have something that's so time sensitive, you need to go raise money. So one thing that we talk about a lot, I think it's chapter eight in the book, we talk about having a bootstrapping mindset and applying bootstrapping principles to innovation departments at large companies, as well as bootstrapping principles being applied to to even VC funded businesses. And, and, you'll, and you've seen it in the last year and a half, a huge recalibration because, you know, we've had a, a lot of flat to mark down valuation territory for a lot of VC funds lately. And you, you've seen a lot of people not being able to raise their B rounds or C rounds. And so there's been a very renewed focus on at least reaching cash neutral. And so even in a VC funded business, you, you have to understand that bootstrapping is a mindset. It's a mindset that can bring fiscal discipline and sustainability, financial sustainability. We're not talking about trees, right? We're talking about money, the other green, the, the green that drives the business. And so financial sustainability 
is critical and cash flow is critical and reaching neutral to positive cash flow is critical in all kinds of business. And of course it can make your run your runway infinity runway in a bootstrap in a, in a VC funded business. So I'd say the first one is that bootstrapping is a mindset and it forces founders to focus on the absolute most important things at all times. And it makes you super resourceful. So I, I've encouraged all of my general partners, all the GPs at the VC funds to really focus on bootstrapping principles to force fiscal discipline, make people resourceful to do a lot lot with a little and and to really focus on prioritization rather than trying to tackle 10 things do one really well. The second thing I would say that's a really a really important takeaway is that there's no individual piece of technology that is a sustainable competitive advantage because eventually other people will require it too. What is truly sustainable in a business is a culture of innovation and the process you use to manifest that culture. You know because I mean look, when I started this thing in 2001, we built with ASP and SQL 97. Then we moved to ASB and SQL 2000, if I remember correctly. I may be misquoting some of the numbers. Then, then .NET 1.0 came out. And, and you know, so we continually had technology that became obsolete, obsolete, obsolete. Then we picked Silverlight, and then Microsoft shuttered Silverlight a year and a half later. We had to rewrite all the Silverlight that we had built. You, there's no individual piece of technology that makes you sustainably competitive. What does make you sustainably competitive is like that process of innovating and prioritizing and creating things, a culture of engineering, culture of innovation, and listening to customers, but not becoming just a custom dev shop for those customers that are product customers, you know, like actually it, it, saying your opinion as well. So there's so much to, to remember that, but you, you just got to acknowledge and recognize that a thing that you might have started the business for that was a great innovation in 2004 is no longer the thing. You got to find a new thing. And that process of finding that new thing is that's the core secret sauce of your business. You know, I love that. And on that second point that you said, it just reminded me of a very uh, time honored CEO, controversial guy, but uh, effective nonetheless. Peter Drucker once said that culture eats strategy for breakfast, right? So that's number one. Back in my product dev days, very often we would have to consult the executives who said, I I want it and I want it now, right? If, if maybe some of you are, are dealing with that right now in your careers who are listening, where you got the this executive and you're managing up and we would have to tell them to say technology is not a strategy and it is not a solution It's not meant to that it is just a tool and if you implement that tool and into the wrong strategy or a horrible process that will magnify your losses and so what James is talking about is absolutely vital. It is important to understand that no tech is a sustainable competitive advantage for long, but your culture and your processes definitely can be. Would you say that's a fair summary on that? Absolutely. hundred percent. Yes. What about say, do you have a third one that you'd like to share that would just really help to light up these entrepreneurs? Well, I'd say if there's a, uh, another, you know, takeaway from this that you walk away from, Mm -hmm. Is that you've got, and this is our this is our sixth core value at JB Knowledge. We have six six core values. You know, do the right thing even when no one's looking. Be self motivated and resourceful. Show respect. Have each other's backs. You know, think lean. It, 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 there's all these great values that we focused on, right? But number six is enjoy the ride and geek out. <laughs> and and enjoy the ride and geek out is really about having something that you're super passionate about. In addition to work, like you should be really excited to go into the office. And if you're not, you got to find it fast. Like you got to find that motivation, but you also should have something outside of work that you're motivated about, whether it's your kids or your hobbies. And then, you know, I have two kids. I'm super passionate about them and trying to help them and trying to launch them. They're, they're both teenagers now. And you know, it's, a, it, it's, it's exciting, but I also have a lot of passions of my own. You know, I still play piano and guitar and I sing and I have a dance group and you know, I, I like to fly whenever I can. And I think it's really important to have passions and to enjoy the ride and geek out uh, we talk about that a lot in our company. I ask people like, "Hey, what are you what are you passionate about? What are you geeking out on right now?" And you know, for a lot of them, you know, some people to be barbecuing. I have one really key leader in my company that's into making chocolate. Like she does it every weekend, man. She's a chocolatier. So cool. So I think it's just really important to not. And you've got to you've got to work to live, not not live the work. Um, if you want to do this for a long time. Now, if you want to if you want to be a uh, you know five years and exit and then go uh, to the beach for two years and then recycle and that's the cycle you want to be in. Okay, I guess. But if you're interested in, in some longevity and really riding a train for a long time, you've got to come to some kind of balance point uh, where you can really enjoy your life and uh, you can enjoy work too and you can be motivated to go to the office every day. So I think that's a really important one. Man, I love it. So. As we wrap things up, James, um, is there anything else that you'd like our fans to know? Any ways to reach out to you? Any anything at all? Yeah, absolutely. First off, uh, I, I record I recorded an audio book along with the book, so I'm, I've been a podcaster for a very long time. Uh, eight 
eight years now, I think. And the original podcast I had, I, I handed over to my co-host. The one I run right now for the last three and a half years is called the Insure Tech Geek Podcast. You can find out more about that in the book, Be Your Own VC, which I recorded my own audio book for as well on Audible. So that's on Amazon, on Audible. You can also just go to my personal website, jamesbenham.com, and it has links to my newsletter. You can sign up for my uh, my newsletter. You can sign up for the podcast and subscribe to it. And you can also get a copy of the book or get a copy of the audio book. All of that is there. My company is JB Knowledge, uh, and that's our, our service business. And we've got two great products called Smart Compliance and Terra, one of which is a certificate tracking platform. The other one is a policy and claim software, a core system that's work comp first. So we we built something that's really good for comp as well as some other lines. And so that's really what you can do to find out more information. But jamesbenham.com has links to just about everything. And you can go check that out and subscribe to my podcast and check the book out and get the audio book and get on the newsletter and all that stuff. I love it. So just to summarize everything, folks, bootstrapping, it's a mindset. So make sure it focuses you on what's important. Number two, the second thing that James told us was no tech is a sustainable competitive advantage. Just remember culture eats strategy for breakfast. So get your culture right, get your processes right, and you just might be able to develop a strategic advantage to ward off a lot of competition. And number three, it's important to enjoy the ride and geek out. You do these things and you too will be well on your way in your pursuit of making billions. 